three young cubs accompanying them. We had three young cubs gambling across a quarantine clearings. And then we had the remarkable tale of two leopards. Sindile, the collared leopard, the recently released after quarantine little survivor, and Mvula and their confrontation and then later truce around an impala kill. And I believe that Brent is out with Gert and he's heading across to see if those two aren't still hanging about. And speaking of said impala kill, it seems as though Brent has managed to make his way into that incredibly tricky position. Let's go and find out what's happening with that impala kill. Welcome to the Sunrise Safari and there we have a tree climbing impala. Now, of course, the impala didn't climb the tree itself. And fortunately for us, the leopards have hoisted. Now, which leopard hoisted, Mvula or Sindile? That remains to be, or it's, I think that's a question we'll never know the answer to. So I'm not sure whether Sindile is still here, but Mvula is, and he's lying on the ground right next to us. So here we go, a leopard to start the sunrise safari. He keeps looking into the little river system below him, so I wonder if young Sindile isn't still close at hand. Now if we look on his neck, you can see there's some dirt sticking to certain spots. Now to me those look like injuries and the dirt sticking to the blood. Uh, whether that's from a fight with Sindile or a f the fight he had with Kojima a few days ago, uh, it's difficult to say. They don't look as fresh as if they happened last night or yesterday. But also I think there's sort of a, a gentleman's agreement, or not really a gentleman's agreement, uh, a young male who's not quite ready to fight and an old male who's tired of fighting. So they've almost decided to share, which is very unusual behavior. And I think this type of stuff probably happens more often than we think out here in the African bush. Now, from where we are, we can't really move too much further forward without disturbing Mvula to check if young... I think I heard him. Now, just come back to the Mvula here quickly. I, I heard something in the drainage line. His ears picked up. So, just literally directly into that thicket there. I think young Sindila is down in the bottom there somewhere. Hopefully he makes an appearance. But this is fascinating behavior. Very steep little section there. Oh, I can't see from where I am. Now, of course, there's always a possibility that Mvula might be young Sindile's father. I think it's unlikely, though from where Shadow, most of Shadow's range is. I think it's more than likely Tingana or even possibly Anderson or a male, I've forgotten his name now, that used to be in the West. T, it begins with a T. I want to say Tumbela, but Tumbela is a leopard I know from a long time ago. We're going to sit here and see how this plays out. Very, very exciting. And of course, I think I might have forgot to mention, my name's Brent. I've got Gert on camera, and this is a live African safari. We've got a leopard sitting six foot, foot from us in the middle of the African bush. We're on Juma Private Game Reserve. And what a way to start the sunrise safari. Now, Mvula has decided to have a snooze. So he's sleeping flat cat next to us. And that shows you how confident and comfortable these leopards are in our presence. Look at that. Stretched out, not a care or worry in the world. Well, that would be a lie. He is quite worried. He is still quite jumpy. Um, especially after his run-in with Gajima, the ghost from the north, last week. Uh, and having another leopard presence is always going to make, make him a bit jumpy. So any little sound and stuff he does lift his head quite quickly. There's still a fair amount of meat left on that carcass. It was a, an adult male impala. You can just 
And now you can see his head hanging below the branch there, just and make out the horns. So quite a bit of the back legs left and maybe the neck. So not too much, especially not too much for two male leopards. A growing boy and a male leopard who's seen better times, Mr. Mvula. hoping that he climbs the tree or the other leopard climbs the tree. And there we go. If we go straight down his spine, he's got a very, very distinct, oh, see he's very, very alert. Wonder. See how his ears are constantly moving. His ears very, very. Very alert. Uh, I'm just trying to look down into the river system to see if young Sindile might make an appearance. You can see that dawn is starting to break. The sun hasn't quite come across our Western horizon yet. So remember you can ask us questions about what's happening here in the bush. You can do that by using the hashtag Safari Live or send us an email questions at wildearth.tv. Oh, back to snoozing. While we hang around here, see what happens, what plays out with Mvula and possibly young Sindile, uh, let's go back to Jamie and see how her tracking of lions is going. Well, at present, I haven't got any tracks of lions, and I'm just thinking perhaps with the cold, the sound is traveling a little bit further than it might on a warm summer's morning. I'm going to do one more loop, but then after that I'm actually going to leave the area. I think that the guys will probably end up finding the lions at some point this morning. Because the, the calls are absolutely everywhere. They've been calling from all around Juma. Now I can guarantee at some point they're going to find some lions. And I really want to get across to um, Cheetah Plains to follow up on reports that there are cheetah tracks coming south into that area. I want to go see if we can't help the guys find them. But we'll do one more loop and check. <sighs> Trying. This is the coldest place on Juma and we're about to go through it. My fingers are now numb. No, they're not actually, they're sore. That's, I don't know how Jandre is feeling having to operate the camera. At least I don't have to do anything fiddly or technical because I'm not sure I'd be able to. Ooh, ooh, and here we go into the dip. Ouch. It's sort of eye-wateringly cold. They say that it is 9 degrees, which is 49 in Fahrenheit. I can tell you that in this dip it's probably about 5 degrees colder than that. And as South Africans we are most definitely not built for enduring cold. Well, I can only speak for myself. I'll tell you that I'm a wuss when it comes to the cold. So is Brent, so is Brian. Chandra is a bit more resilient in that sense, although he's got a blanket, several several jackets and several gloves. Cold, 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 cold. 
all of these low-lying drainage lines or river systems where all the cold air sinks into and we find ourselves freezing. Whew. Trying to work out a way I could put one hand underneath my jacket where the hot water bottle is. Okay, lions were calling from sort of this direction. I haven't picked up any tracks. As I said, I'm not going to focus too much on searching for them. I can almost guarantee that with Taxon and Aubrey out and Ephraim on his way and Brent around the area, we will they will be found unless they decide to cross out. Cold, 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 cold. I think Brent had the right idea going back and checking on a static sighting. And as you can see, by the way, my beanie still hasn't emerged. It still hasn't revealed itself. I have a funny feeling that when Brent clears out the car today, perhaps it will turn up. Even though he promises me it's not in there. We'll see. Uh, yesterday we of course had the lions being thoroughly active trying to chase buffalo the females even ended up chasing a giraffe at the end of the sunset safari yesterday however Gary with an inimitable sense of humor would like to know if they're called lions because they're always lying around <laughs> I don't know Gary um, <laughs> perhaps uh, perhaps you might want to, perhaps we could suggest it to when we next see them. I wonder if they're lying around or if they are somewhere in the general vicinity. I think they're on the move, to be 100% honest with you, contrary to their general state of being. Oh. Last night, by the way, we had some really interesting incidents with elephants. As the drought continues, they've been pushing to feed around the, because what happens around camps is even if it's not a watered camp, you've still got water pipelines and so on, they very often leak out a little bit more water through. I'll continue the story later, our signal's not great, let's do back to Brent. So you can see not much has changed here in the position around this impala kill. Mvula is still sleeping quite heavily and I said if we move any further forward we might disturb him. So just playing a bit of the patience game at the moment and we are hoping for young Sindile to make an appearance. It'll be very interesting if he tries to climb the tree to watch Mvula's reaction. Of course I've heard all about what was happening from Jamie, but it's always better to watch it for oneself. And that is one of the reasons we have two vehicles, and it gives you guys the chance to bounce between the two of us and see all the fan fantastic things that are happening here in the African bush on Safari Live. Now, we've seen lots of lions and leopards recently, so hopefully. Jamie has some cheetah luck down on cheetah plains. Now if we look at Mvula's back, there it is. And if you come straight off his tail, it almost looks like he's got a little landing strip. Very, very equidistant spot pattern there. One of his diagnostic features. Margaret's wondering, did Mvula get enough to eat? 
He doesn't look that full. I think, Margaret, it's just the way he's, he's lying. Uh, he does look like he's got quite a full Betty. So I think it's just because he's lying on his side. He's also lying at a slight angle uh, that it doesn't look like he's that full. But, but I think he has had quite a bit to eat. Um, now, Herbert mentioned he saw some quite fresh, big scratch marks on him. And I think that's uh, when he was sitting up the mud or dirt that was stuck to his neck was from the fight. I don't think it was from fighting with Cindy Leo. Could have been, you never know. But I think it was more likely um, from his argument with uh, Gajima last week. Now, he's doing quite well, and I said it's not unusual for a male leopard to, after he's lost his territory, to survive for a couple of years afterwards. Um, they tend to hang around their own old home range for a while before right towards the end becoming extremely nomadic. Sorry, I just got to be on the game drive radio. A firm tax. Five five um, is Lala on the western bank um, near the Tambuti tree. Over, make your way. As you know, this is quite a difficult area. So I'm going to have to maneuver just now to make some space for tax. We won't leave, but uh, we might not have the best visual. And he is just sleeping at the moment. I'm really hoping that young Sindile is still close by in the drainage line. So I might maneuver a little bit to see if we can have a look into the into the little river system here to see if we can see young Sindile. James is wondering, apart from holding on to this meal, since none of these leopards hold territory, what would be the benefit of Mvula fighting Sindile? Well, firstly, I think it's, a lot of it's got to do with instinct, but uh, the benefit is the meal. Mvula has been struggling to keep fat over the last while, and I've heard from the guys where he's been in Sibambili, he's been eating scrub hares and tortoises, so he is, is struggling, probably not because his hunting is, is too badly affected, possibly because every time he does get a meal, he's chased off it by other dominant males in the area. So for him, a big meal like this is, is definitely worth the fight. It'll extend his chances of survival drastically. Now, as I said, we've got to move now, so it's going to bash and crash a bit. Um, I'm going to try to see. I can hear Taxon coming in, so I do need to make space so he can also see the leopard. And I want to see if young Sindile is not in the river down there. Hmm. And so while we try find out if young Sindile is here, let's go back to Jamie and see how she's doing. Oh, well, Brent repositions and sees if whether or not he can get a view of our second male at the kill site. We're going to move on. I'm not going to linger too long in searching for these lions as I said I want to start making my way across to Cheetah Plains and I've heard an interesting report from our southern boundary so we're going to go along via there see what's happening and then continue our search on Cheetah Plains just because it's been such a long time since we I say such a long time it's probably been about three days but it feels like a long time since we last went east and investigated that part of our traverse area the only disadvantage, of course, is that it means driving relatively quickly along the southern boundary. And it can be incredibly chilly. I'm going to stop for one moment if this Oriole will cooperate. Can you see it sitting there? Got it. Thank you. You black headed Oriole. And it just flew out right in front of my face. And 
There he goes. I always think of Sam whenever I see black-headed orioles. They were his favorite bird. Also gives us a nice opportunity to just sit and listen for any sounds of lions on our way. Definitely one of the most striking birds that we get out here. And somewhere, if we listen closely, there is a woodpecker furiously at work. You can hear it off somewhere in that over there. All right, let's go forward a bit. There's some very fluffed up looking in Yala in front of me, shivering in the cold. Well, there were some very fluffed up in Yala in front of me, shivering in the cold. I don't know where they went. Oh, there they are. Hello, guys. A bit chilly this morning. Then definitely look looking a very deep red colour. This is about as fluffy as a female in Yala will get. Trying to insulate themselves against the morning chill. And on this beautiful winter's morning. It's totally still and the birds are making a racket around us. Oh. thought I just heard a lion. I think it was my stomach. Was it your stomach, Chandra? Uh -huh. Aha! <laughs> Okay, well at least it wasn't my stomach this time. I thought it was, thought it was of the most half-hearted lion roar I'd ever heard. <laughs> but apparently not. Apparently just John Ray's stomach. <laughs> not the first time that mistake's ever been made. <coughs> Got very hopeful there for a second, John Ray. Sorry. It's okay. <laughs> Let's carry on. Make our way to the eastern boundary. I was busy telling the story about the elephants from last night. When we left, when Brent and myself left the main camp, left DRC, they were everywhere trying to feed and we sent a warning through to say don't forget to shut the gate because otherwise they're going to walk into the car park and pull down the tree on top of all of the cars there. Uh, that was duly done, then I realized that Brent had forgotten, or Brent realized he'd forgotten something and I went racing back to the DRC, had to park right up against the gate to try and sneak in and then we clo they closed the gate behind us, off we went back home, arrived this morning and the elephants had just decided that this puny human gate was not something that was going to keep them from the tree that they wanted and so they ploughed through the gate and into the car park anyway. Fortunately the cars managed to escape any major damage I'm not quite sure how, although I think that poor Jerry, whose room was right outside the tree that they were so intent on feeding upon, I'm not entirely sure exactly how much sleep she managed last night. But yes, as the drought sort of, well, as the dry season combined with the drought slowly continues, animals are becoming more and more determined to get to whatever food they can find even if that means pushing through a gate. It does mean that we're all being especially vigilant whenever we're walking out in the dark. Because there's nothing like a surprise big grey shape in looming out of the darkness in front of you to really kickstart your adrenaline system first thing in the morning. Putting off this cheetah plains journey because I know it's going to be freezing. But it would be very, very nice to go and see some cheetah. We've been spoiled with leopard and lion sightings. Time for us to add cheetah to the list.
while we journey across to Cheetah Plains in the crisp winter's morning. Let's go back across, see whether Brent has managed to get you a different view of the Bula. Well, a slightly different view of the Bula. But there we can see his belly's not so. Oh, his, I think your jacket got, got there. There we go. Um, you can see he is quite full. He has eaten enough. And hopefully he's going to feed again. Now, if we come back across over my shoulder in the river system through that little bush there, we can just make out Sindile. Fast asleep as well. So lying below, about equidistant from the kill itself in the tree. So I wonder which leopard's going to climb to feed first. Now, if we come out again and we look onto the ground in front of me there, there's some white on the ground. And just through the bush there, bush. Oh, um, it's just behind the bush for you guys, but there's a bunch of impala fluff on the ground. And, and those of you who've been watching for a long time will have watched leopards, how they pluck the carcass of the hair. Now, if we look at the carcass itself, which we're a bit closer to, we can actually see where the fur has been plucked. as far up as we can go so if we zoom maybe a little bit more just I'll try and stop there you can just see on his rump that there's a lot of fur that's been plucked there by the leopards now of course they do consume a lot of fur of the animals they eat but then not by on purpose by any means um, by accident they prefer to have a hairless meal and it causes them to have quite impressive fur balls and uh, also in their in their in their dung you'll find a lot of fur of what they've been feeding off so we are now perfectly positioned between two male leopards who is going to be the first to feed that is the question now remember we are on a live african safari and you can ask us questions about what's going on although at the moment the leopards aren't very much flat cats sleeping but they do have a kill in the tree next to us and uh, remember, questions at wildearth.tv if you're an emailer, or hashtag Safari Live if you're a, a tweeter. Oh, let's have a, another look at Mr. Mvula, who is lying very comfortably. Sandy in Tennessee says there seems to be a lot of other male leopard activity in Tingana's territory. Uh, when was the last confirmed sighting of Tingana? I think it was yesterday, um, just to the west of Arethusa, just off our traverse. So he could be on his way this, in this direction. Now also, this area is actually right on the boundary between Tingana and Gajima. So, very, very interesting. There we go. Here's the kill. And the sun is peeking up through the, over the western horizon. So we could get some lovely light shortly. And uh, I will be quite happy because we might start warming up slightly because it is very chilly. Uh, and we're sitting down low in a little river system where it's even colder. So, hopefully, uh, we're going to get some... Ah, there we go. I just... Who was asking about Tingana Sandy? Tingana's just been found on the Cheetah Plains driveway, so maybe Jamie will get there before he crosses into Torchwood. So he is on his way up this area. Now, looking at the kill, hopefully, uh, for these two, they'll be finished before Mr. Tingana gets here, but he can walk... 
So there's a strong possibility he could even be in this area by the sunset safari. So interesting times ahead. Now, I wonder whether they didn't put this kill up in the tree due to the fact there were a lot of lions around this area this morning. And I even heard lions calling just to the north of here. Oh, unfortunately, Tangana crossed straight over the Cheetah Plains driveway into Torchwood before Jamie was able to get there. So, unfortunately, Sandy, we're not going to see him this morning, but we do know where he is, and he is on his way north. So, it's going to be a very exciting sunset safari to see what happens there. Oh, eyes are up. Miss Lions. Close to us as well. It sounds like maybe Gallagher, Shortcut, Voyot, and Teller. No, but for the north, Aubrey's. Aubrey, Sandy, Patch. Maybe. I don't know if you guys heard those lions. So, the lions almost due west of us. You're going to go look, Tax. Where are Aubrey's? Yeah. They were calling this side, this side, and south this morning. All over the place, lions. So there we go. We're going to sit and see what happens with these leopards. Tax is actually going to go see if he can find those roaring lions. So that's why it's important to be on the Game Drive channels. Oh, here we go. Are we going to go climb a tree, Mr. Mvula? Or are we just lifting our head to make sure young Sindile is still sleeping in the same place? Oh, looking up at the carcass. If you hear a few knocks about, it's just me opening my camera case. Well, hello, Hollows in Wisconsin. Now, Hollows is wondering how do we ID the different leopards due to their spots. Now, if we look at his face, the, we get to know quite a lot of these leopards very well. So. That makes it a little bit easier, um, but normally, um, if we're not, if it's a leopard, we're not sure. <coughs> oh, excuse me. Um, we will look at its spot pattern. Now, each individual leopard has a very unique spot pattern. I'm just going to get a photo of it. Let's zoom a bit more than the camera. Come on, turn your face this way, Mr. Mvula. I get one of the right hand side. Okay, I'm just going to wait for him to turn. I think he might. He's looking intently where young Sindile is still fast asleep below me. Is he contemplating a trip up the tree? That is the next question. I think he might be. At least it gives me another chance to get the spot pattern. Okay. Now, here we go, hollows. I've got... So, the easiest way and the most unique spot pattern we find on a lot of leopards, and the one that is used for ID most often, is that line of spots just above the last line of whiskers. So, there we go. You see them there. So here's a one, two, three, four on the right. And then where's the picture of him lying down? There we go. One, two, three on the left. So he's a four, three leopard is how we would describe him. Oh, that's actually quite a nice photo. And I was just looking to get spot patterns. Oh, his head's up. Now... Remember to share your screenshots with us on the Facebook Safari Live page or you can pop it on 
any of the many Facebook fan groups we have or on Twitter with the hashtag Safari Live. Now, even though Mvula is quite an old male, you can see those tatty ears. He is still a really beautiful boy. He's got incredible eyes. And boof, back to sleep. Now, Jen B is wondering if the fact that his ears are so tattered, would it affect his hearing? Not at all, Jen. Um, maybe a slightly, but nothing that would really, really make a bit, big difference. Oh, he's tired, Kitty. And the other Kitty is also a very tired Kitty. Now, we are going to get some lovely light on Mr. Mvula shortly. Now look at his left eye, sorry, his right eye, no, left eye, the one closest to the ground, the right eye. You can see that little membrane, oh, he's closed his eyes now, coming across a little protective membrane that you can sometimes see in leopards. Oh, it's tired, Kitty. Oh, Sandile has lifted his head, but again, we can't really see him through the bush, and I can't really move too much further forward without disappearing into that river. But his head is still up. Oh, is he going to put his head down again? I'll just move my shoulder so you can see over it. Ah, oh, there we go. And head down again. And he's up. Tired kitty. And you're going to just make out his head through the baby jackal bear. No, it's a quarry bush, sorry, it's not a baby jackal bear. So, no one's feeding at the moment, uh, but I am hoping that one of them feeds shortly. Now, Tax is left. I'm going to just scoot up a little bit because, oh, Mvul is up. Let's just wait a second. Oh, you can see that lovely early morning light creeping through. So, a lot of people have different ways of recognizing our leopards, they look at different spot patterns, but the sort of recognized way that the scientific community identifies leopard is from those spots just above uh, the last line of whiskers. Looks like he's trying to get comfortable with that big belly of his. Now, as I said, we're right on the boundary between Tingana's territory and Gajima's territory. So. That would explain why he's so nervous looking up, and he has had a run-in with Kojima not far from here recently. Now, Jamie has managed to get all the way down to Cheetah Plains, so let's see what update she's got for us from that part of the world. We actually haven't managed to get all the way to Cheetah Plains. We're on the driveway now. And just by the way, I did hear that update about Tingano a little bit earlier. However, when I heard it, he was in the process of crossing into Torchwood. So he'd already disappeared off our traverse area. Now what I mean by that, for new viewers, my lips are numb and they don't want to enunciate anything. Um, for new viewers, Tingano is a dominant male leopard. He's absolutely enormous. But we have certain areas that we can drive and certain areas that we can't drive on. And Torchwood is one of those areas. So unfortunately, we just there's no way we could have got there in time. He was already in the process of crossing when we were still close to quarantine clearings. 
I would just be thinking, driving along and cataloging all the different smells. I've decided that the next step for these live safaris is a huge scratch and sniff book that you can order. And basically we'll tell you what page to turn to whenever we're experiencing a nice uh, or a, a type of smell. We already give you the temperature updates, but you can have the, the petrichor page on page one the smell after the rain and then maybe page two will be fresh elephant dung page three water buck four wild dog and and then you get to the slightly more unpleasant ones and you can always I suppose choose whether or not you scratch and sniff the the lion dung the lion scat or you'll have to have different different scratch and sniff categories for things like day old buffalo day old buffalo and clone three day old buffalo in 40 degree heat and so on but I feel as though that's the final one of the final steps in our all over safari experience you've already got a live interactive safari experience scratch and sniff is most definitely in my mind the next step just think of all the smells there you could have you could have the flowers, the turpentine grass, you'd end up with about a, a 200 page book of different senses or different senses of smell that you could experience. Sorry guys, my Game Drive channel's been very busy this morning. Just listening to updates around there. We are about to hit the driveway and the dip of Cheetah Plains, so we're not yet out of the bad signal regions. I've been looking for an animal to keep us distracted with, but unfortunately, having just had Tingana walk through along this Cheetah Plains driveway, it seems as though most of the animals are still in hiding thanks to his approach. So we are going to go into the dip relatively soon. Here we go, our Cheetah Plains Lodge sign. And Nets over there, and Coral over there. Cheetah Plains over here. Off we go, we'll send you back to Brent before we disappear. So we're still sitting here, absolutely no change, uh, except that the sun's coming through and hopefully it will help thaw our bones. Uh, Vula's still sleeping to the left. Sindila's still sleeping down in the, in the drainage system. Oh, sorry, my shoulder. A little bit too, there we go. It looked like he was dreaming. I saw his ears and mouth moving. There we go. So this is very interesting. I mean, I haven't seen any sign of aggression. I've seen some wariness on both parties looking at each other but no sign of aggression yet. Sorry, I keep almost falling down. So we're sitting oh, about 20, 25 degrees. So I keep sliding forward. So if I end up rolling over the bonnet, don't mind. But I'm just gonna look at the lovely light coming through now. Now, curious ones wondering, can a leopard sneak up on another leopard easily? Uh, sometimes, yes. I mean, I have seen a female leopard sneak up on another female leopard and attack her savagely. And it was a young female, and she wandered into the next female over territory and, and got a really, really severe beating. She actually burst one of the blood vessels in her eye and became blind in that eye, and that was the last time I ever saw that young leopard. So it does happen from time to time. Uh, but normally, uh, when a leopard sneaks up another leopard, the, the leopard's distracted, mating, feeding, 
uh, or there's strong winds around. But it isn't, isn't that common. Normally they'll see each other and manage to avoid each other. Most animals out here will try avoid conflict at all costs. And uh, a lot of posturing normally goes a long way in, in defeating your enemy. But in those there is always those occasions where, where violence is, does happen. And when it does happen, it is quite brutal and quite savage. Come on, guys, get hungry. It's supposed to be nice and cool. You don't want to be eating up there when it's hot. You can see the sun is directly in front of us. Now, Julie's wondering, do leopards ever get cold and make nests uh, while well, they're always lying out in the open? Uh, they do get cold, uh, but they never make a nest as such. They'll just curl up. And the bigger problem for leopards is getting hot. So they get hot very easily, and especially with full bellies, uh, digestion causes energy, causes heat. So they're probably very much enjoying this cold morning with their full bellies as they snooze, waiting for their stomachs to digest enough that they can go start feeding again. And now the sun's popping up. We're starting to get the dawn chorus. You can hear a white-browed scrub robin. And... What else can we have? Wood hoopoos in the distance. And I'm trying to listen to what else I can hear. What else can we hear? Oriole. Black headed Oriole. I think you saw one with Jamie a little earlier. Starlings. Bulldozers. <laughs> oh, bulldozers. My favorite sound in the morning. Um, blue butter frog is wondering if one of the leopards got up, would the other immediately move to block it? Now, that is a question I can't answer till one of them gets up. So maybe, maybe not. We're going to have to wait and see. And that's the exciting thing about spending so much time with these big cats. Is they could show and display behavior that has never been recorded, or if it has, it's very, very rare. And we've been fortunate enough to see quite a lot of that behavior, specifically with young Sindile. Uh, very unique story. Uh, he was born to Shadow. Uh, who is the dominant female around Arethusa and the, the far western reaches of Juma. And uh, just at about a year old, uh, he caught a rabid dog. We were actually there and we, we saw it. It was quite disturbing. And, well, we didn't know the dog was rabid at the time, so we chased him off the, 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 the carcass. And, and then the dog was destroyed. And then it was sent to... Ornestapuit, which is the big veterinary, uh, veterinary, what, how would you describe Ornestapuit? It's part of the University of Pretoria, but it's basically one of the most massive veterinary departments in the world. And they do lots of stuff on wildlife and domestic animals. And the brain was tested, tested positive for rabies. Then young Sandile was darted and put into quarantine and given uh, rabies shots to make sure he didn't contract it. There was no ways we could leave him out here because if he did come become positive rabies, he's a massive danger to all the animals around. And so he then went into quarantine for sure, seven, seven, nearly eight months. And then he was re-released back into the wild. And he's picked up another nickname, the Wanderer. Now he's wandered big distances up and down and around. And we were lucky enough to see him probably one of the first times he saw his mom. So when he left his mom at about a year, she still would have been looking after him. But in the time he was away, 
she mated and gave birth to another set of cubs. She lost the male cub, but she still got the female cub. And she was calling for the cub, and he thought, well, mom must be calling for me. Ow, ow. And then mom wasn't calling for him, absolutely beat the daylights out of him, trying to protect her new cub, because he would have been a massive threat to that new cub. He might kill it. Uh, but his mom managed to keep him away from the cub. And then he went wandering again, and... He's wandered all the way into Kruger Park, down to Mala Mala, onto the Sand River, and now he's moved back up into, into the north. He's a little bit further to the east of his mom's territory. His mom's territory is behind us, about where we heard those lions roaring. Uh, and, I mean, we got to see that behavior, and that's probably never been recorded because it's such an unusual circumstance of a young male leaving and then coming back. And now we see him with a male that's probably not his dad, and they're sharing an impala carcass. So really, really fascinating stuff. Uh, and it's incredible. The more you watch leopards, the less you realize you know for sure, and, and things can always change, and that's the amazing thing about the bush. But while we wait here to see what happens next, let's go to Jamie, who's on Cheetah Plains, deep in the east, uh, for an update. Oh, all is spectacularly quiet here on Cheetah Plains. I saw one impala really far away, looking very cold. We've arrived at three in a row pan in the hope that perhaps some animals are on their way for an early morning drink before we head across to the open area to see whether or not we can follow up on those tracks of cheetah that apparently crossed south. Three in a row pan has sort of become two in a row pan though. Ah, oh, it's the hornbill. He combined with elephant dung here to look very strange. Here we go. I thought we had some kind of bizarre bird in front of us, or at least an unexpected one, but it turned out to just be a hornbill plucking through elephant dung. Yesterday, Chat and I watched a seriously fierce hornbill fight between two males. They grabbed each other by the bulls and were sort of pushing each other around. It was quite it was probably the most violent hornbill fight I've ever seen, actually. All closely watched by a third onlooker. I always find it entertaining to just sit and watch them run for a moment. But let us carry on, see if anything's at the pan. Whether there's any sign of life here. And then, as I said, we're heading to the open area. And Shamsun, you've said it, uh, an ostrich would be nice. Or, even better, a cheetah chasing an ostrich. promise you, one day, we're going to be able to film that. We're going to be able to film cheetah chasing something across the open plain. And there's a good chance it could be an ostrich. And that, I think, would be unbelievable to witness. I've seen, I've been fortunate enough to see cheetah hunting ostrich before in the Kalahari. And it is quite a spectacle. Oh, shame, little Steenbuki. It's a bit difficult for you to get to drink, isn't it? If I go any closer, he's going to disappear. In fact, he's already thinking, he or she is already thinking of disappearing. Oh, there's two. There's two of them together. And in fact, I think it might even be mom and baby. That little one that you're looking at now looks much smaller than the adult off to the right. Oh, cute, yes. Just definitely mom and baby. Little one is very, very thirsty but trying to figure out a way to get to the water. A oh, cute baby steenbok. They are definitely one of the cutest antelope to see. Stopping for a little bit of nib a nibble on the edge of three in a row pan. It really, its ears are absurdly big compared to its body. There's mom coming to double check on her little one. I actually think it might be a little male. I thought I saw horns starting to come up. You can see the size difference now that they're together. 
And I mean, Steenbok don't have small ears to start with, but this ones look absolutely enormous. Yeah, I'm sure, maybe I'm imagining it, but I think I see horns. Hello, little one, with your enormous ears. You are very cute. Oh, gave Mum a bit of a fright there. It's such a beautiful steambook sighting. So often we just see their disappearing rumps as they race off away from us. It's really nice to see them relaxed and feeding on the opposite side of the pan. And I wonder if they're going to try and brave the mud to go and have a drink. It's going to be very, very sticky for them. They probably don't want to risk getting bogged down, and it does happen. Antelope do get stuck in the muddy remains of watering holes. Yes, it is a little male. Sure those are tiny, tiny horns that are starting to poke up? Just starting to grow from the base of its skull. Aren't you cute? <laughs> and of course, the big difference between our antelope and the deer of other parts of the world is the fact that while his horns are growing, they are de it's depositing solid bone as it continues to grow. So it's not like the hardened blood vessels of a deer or a deer's antlers, it's solid bone that has to grow with a keratin sheath around it like a fingernail. And Jen, you were wondering about how, because it's difficult to get a sense of scale, how big that baby steambook is. I'm just trying to think of a, re of a good comparison, Jen. Um, trying to think breeds of dog. Come on, little one, I need you to come out a little bit so I can see exactly how big you are. He'd only come up to, he would only come up to about my knee, to give you an idea height-wise. I'm five foot seven, and he'd probably be about knee height on me. But I'm trying to think of a breed of dog. I thought about a Staffy, um, a Staffordshire Terrier. But I actually think he's shorter than a than especially for those of you in America, because your American Staffordshire Terriers are actually much taller than the British Staffordshire Terriers. So he's a bit smaller. He's he's a bit smaller and definitely a lot lighter than an American Staffy. Mm. Almost actually the size of one of those sort of long-legged, wirehead fox terriers. I think I need to go and research my breeds of dogs so that I can provide them as useful comparisons. He is less, suffice to say, he's very small. He's probably a good couple of months old, maybe four or five, and will be independent of mom. Well, is already completely weaned and will be independent from mom in the next few months. You gonna go have a drink, girl? Isn't she beautiful in this morning light? Always constantly alert, especially in these more open areas where they feel slightly more vulnerable. As an animal that is basically adapted for dense vegetation or being secretive, the stem will feel a bit more uncomfortable and more exposed here. That 
being said, it's very, very, very difficult for a predator to sneak up on them at this point in winter around this waterhole. It's more exiting this area or entering this area that they would have to be particularly careful. But once they're here, I can't imagine that anything would get past their incredibly sensitive senses. I mean, I'm looking around and there's absolutely no cover for anything to hide behind. That being said, at this time of year, the water holes are where the poor animals have to go. They're forced in to areas like this, which means for the predators, they very often just have to stick around and wait for their food to come to them. Making her way back towards her son, see what he's up to. Okay. I think let us carry on, head towards the open area, before those cheetah have a chance to disappear south into Mala Mala. While we do, let's go back to a different type of spotted cat. Not much has changed here, apart from Vula rolling over. Oh, it looks like he might roll over again, except the light has got fantastic on him. He is stretching and looking a little restless, so I'm hoping he possibly decides to climb the tree shortly. Or he could just be trying to move because of that large belly of his. Now, if he does climb the tree, we're not going to be able to get our camera up there so there's not a great sighting of young, young Sindile. His head is not up. He's lying absolutely flat in the river system. So I'm going to just move a little bit forward so if they, he does climb the tree. Oh, and he sat up. Are you going to climb the tree or your belly just getting a little bit uncomfortable? Oh, and now <laughs> he sat up. Sindile just yawned, but he went back to sleep. There we go. And you can see he's walking quite stiff. And you can see his, his back hips are starting to show a little bit. And that's a very... Very, very stiff. He might just be looking for a new place to sleep. Come on, go climb the tree. Trying to see these big scratch marks that Herbert said he saw. And you can definitely see he's walking quite stiff. I mean, it's expected if you have a dust up with a nice male leopard in his prime. Oh, he does look a bit sore. Oh, Sindile is running up the tree. Quickly, quickly in front of us. As soon as he saw Mvula heading for the tree, up he went. Now there's growling and snarling. Unfortunately, the sun is right behind. So as, as Mvula moved, Sindili just shot up the tree like a rocket. I'm going to try and move to get a slightly better light. Now, what's Mvula going to do? Mvula is going to lie down again. <laughs> now, <laughs> okay, we're just going to reposition now. So the light's quite difficult on... Oh, he's going up higher, right above the kill. And we can't see anything because of the sun. Let's hold on. Oh, how's that? That's fine. We'll try and move again just now, but just so we can see what's going on. It's still growling. Oh, 
this is this is this could be this could be good. He might try to push Cindy out of the tree. Here we go. He's going to go up the tree. This is good. Oh, look at that! Oh, Cindy is down. How oh, incredible! The old man's got a bit of fight in him yet. <laughs> wow! Oh dear, I pulled my earpiece out in all that excitement. Wow, wasn't that amazing? How was that sound? So I said, at most times, leopards will try to avoid confrontation, but sometimes you just can't. And I must admit, I'm quite impressed with the gall of young Sindile. Um, Vula's trying to feed. I'm just going to try to find a better spot. Now, a huge welcome to a brand new viewer, Crafting Princess, who's wondering, if, is this really a live stream? Well, yes it is. You just saw two male lions fight in the top of the tree live. I'm not male lions, male leopards, sorry. And, and Crafting Princess's next question is, what's my favorite, a lion or a leopard? Well, between the big cats, I don't really have a favorite. I love them both. But my favorite animal out here is the African wild dog. Oh, there you see. Look, there's Sandile on the other side, looking a little bit sheepish. So it's just going to, there we go. You got him there? Just to the right. Yeah, there he is. I wonder. And you can actually hear Mvula chewing above us. Do you have a good view of Mvula as well? Okay, so do I need to move a little bit further to the north? We're just going to see. Okay, we're just trying to reposition now with the camera to see if we can see the leopard feeding in the tree. Or do I need to go a little bit further? No, we're good. There he is. Now, it's really important when it comes to these sightings to have patience. I mean, we've sat here for an hour and, no, no, yeah, about an hour and 10 minutes with absolutely nothing happening. And then all of a sudden, in a few split seconds, pandemonium can break loose. I wonder how many times this has happened overnight and yesterday when no one was here. So, C Crafting Princess, you chose a wonderful day to start watching Safari Live. And, of course, we see incredible stuff constantly. But it's very seldom that we see stuff exactly like that. And we spend six hours a day, every day, out here on safari. Um, so if you've just found us, in the mornings at the moment, it's from 6.30 a.m. Central African time to 9.30 a.m. Central African time. And in the evenings, 3 p.m. Central African time to 6 p.m. Central African time. Oh, sorry, I just need to be on the Game Drive radio. Standing by. I firm taxi. Um, will I just child them on ping pong?
he's still here, yeah, just on the other side of the shkova. We have lost sight of young Cindy there. Do you see him? He could have moved back down into the river. And look at that. Let's focus on Mr. Mbula. He was devouring that male impala. Now, earlier we were chatting about why the risk of a fight when both of these are non-territorial males. And it's fascinating. They're both at different spectrums. Young Sindile is setting out on his own. He's got about three years or so before he's big enough to challenge for his own territory. So till then he's going to be nomadic, uh, moving around, trying to avoid big males. And Imvula is at the opposite end. He's lost his territory to Tingana and to Gajima. And he's a nomadic male for a different reason. It's because he's at the end of his his life and that's probably why there has been the tolerance there is but Mvula has not been looking well recently he hasn't been feeding and I'm pretty certain he stole this kill from Sindile and to get that protein that meat it was worth his while fighting that young male atop this Timburti Now, the one thing that noise might bring in is hyenas, and that's why the trees, I mean, the kills safely up in the tree. Yeah, those crunches, I'm just going to keep quiet for a second. Oh, yeah, we just... Okay, it's just asked me to move slightly so we can try and move that branch out of the way. So I'm going to do that quickly. There. Actually, the thing I'm going to do is I'm going to try to go over that bush there. It should be better. How's that? Let's have a look. So I'm just going to wait for the head to zoom in so I can have a look. What? Okay, let's... There we go. Okay, I'm just trying to have a quick look if I can see... Sindile. I don't know if he's dropped back into the drainage or after that beating he's decided it's time to relinquish what's left of this impala. I've got a feeling he's quite a precocious youngster that maybe he hasn't quite given up yet and he's still hanging about somewhere. And another question from Crafting Princess, our latest Safari Live viewer, hopefully to become fan, would like to know, why do we name the leopards? It's more for our, uh, our, our joy, and, uh, and a lot of it's to do with identification. There are some ongoing research projects um, and on territories and dispersal, dispersal patterns of male and female leopards. Uh, and it just makes us easier to keep track of which leopards are around. Now, I've been at Safari Live for about, a, oof, I think it's a year and six months now, more or less, since February last year. And in that time, we've seen, I've personally seen 20 different individual leopards. And it's always nice to 
understand the dynamics and it's much easier if you can identify the different individuals and as I said this is incredibly interesting behavior uh, with this young male and a male that he's probably not related to and this fascinating sort of standoff that's been going on and now the carcass is becoming a little bit less or it's becoming nearly finished that there will be more aggression for over that last remaining bit of meat. The sun is warming up, so sorry if you hear a zip. It's just me trying to cool down after all this excitement. Look at that, he's really getting stuck into that impala. Ted, can you see Sindile from your perch behind me? Mm, no. no, me neither. Now, as I said, he's quite a precocious youngster. He might still be close by. So while Mbula is crushing through some of those smaller bones in the Impala's forequarters, uh, there's, we've got an action replay of that fight that just happened. So let's go have a look at it. How incredible was that? And as I keep saying, patience is the most important weapon in your arsenal for sightings. And sometimes you have to sit with flat cats for a very long time to see these incredible interactions. And as I said, we sat for an hour and ten minutes with barely a movement from either leopard. And then in a split second, it all changed. I'm still looking around, trying to make sure where young Sindali is. So, from a leap of leopards to a dazzle of zebras. A dazzle of zebra and one wildebeest. <laughs> one slightly confused normal Norman at Cheetah Plains Pan. And what an extraordinary morning this has turned out to be. Now, not quite the conflict that you've just seen on your screen, but the zebra are also a little bit tetchy at the moment. There's two little ones, very fluffy foals, and they've been having a couple of arguments over access to the water, some nips and bites, and the odd yip. Zebra can be incredibly vocal and also incredibly aggressive creatures when they want to be. And with such a huge herd, you are bound to find that there is a little bit of conflict. Probably got about 13 or 14 zebra here, plus normal Norman, who looks a little bit confused to find himself in this situation. And there's a we see this herd relatively regularly. There's a group of stallions, a bachelor herd, as well as the harem of the male zebra. Just bear with me one moment. I'm just going to say good morning to one of the other vehicles. Morning, guys. Good, thanks. How are you? Good. Those kunk kunk, did they cross south? They cross south. We just, when we get there, they were already there on that uh, Clarence Hill. <laughs> Straight south. Straight. Were they still moving? Okay. <laughs> Thanks, guys. There is a Tambinari coming from there. I'm sure maybe 10, 15 they'll be here. Oh, awesome. Yeah, Perfect. 
on their way to us. Yeah, they're coming this way. Perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, yeah. cheers, guys. I'm Um, there's at least two on Druma, um, and then I think probably a couple around. They've been spending a lot of time going up to Manuleti. Yeah, I think they're fighting somebody there. Okay. Yeah. And then Nkuma's also always around Druma, Torchwood. But yeah, we'll, we'll try to send them south to you guys sometime. Even when we can see them from here to the zebra spine, as long as we see that it's there. <laughs> I'll put in a good word. <laughs> Cheers, guys. Alrighty, so an update on our cheetah. They have gone into Mala Mala, unfortunately. However, apparently there's a huge breeding herd of buffalo on their way to come and have a drink. We just missed those, well, we didn't just miss those cheetah. They had crossed. By the time we got the report of the tracks, they were already in Mala Mala. And apparently they've gone all the way onto the other side of the dam wall and are continuing south. Next time, guys, we'll have to just keep trying because they'll got to come back north at some point. <laughs> but they keep managing to dodge us somehow. Well, our zebras seem to have calmed down. They've split off into the harem and then the bachelor herd. The harem, or the breeding herd there next to Norman, the normal gnu, with the little foals. Oh, a couple of Fleming grimaces are happening as well. Perhaps one of the females is coming to Eastress. That might explain the continued presence of the bachelor group. And they... What are they thinking about? Are we going to go back for another drink? Are you happy here? Nice size comparison between the wildebeest and the zebra. Get an idea of just how tall and stocky zebra actually are, because a wildebeest is not a small animal either. And very restless. Well, it's also very common to see wildebeest with zebra. It's a safety and numbers deal, particularly for the male wildebeest. They're often there on their own. What's happening here, guys? Mm. Wouldn't call that affectionate. Just a little bit of disagreement happening. There's quite a few young stallions in that harem as well. You can tell when you look beneath the swishing tails if the black stripe between the cheeks of the bottom is a thin stripe, it is a male. If it is a fatter black stripe, then it is a female. You can also watch and judge from their behavior. Oh, somebody's exhausted. Time to lie down and have a little bit of a rest. And Cheetah Plains always provides incredibly interesting sightings in these open areas. Of course, with absolute pleasure, Shamsun, I would love to explain the zebra hierarchy to you. Right, so we've got, obviously we've got our harem system. What that means for zebra is one male collects a group of females together. And Shamsun, I'm going to continue this in a moment. But I'm going to try and reposition to get a slightly different view of these zebras so that we're not quite trying to work it out according to the sun. So Shamsun, the male of a zebra herd, collects his mares or his females. Is this going to make it worse, Chandre? Sort of. Yeah, let's try again this one a little bit closer because they are being very active at the moment. A male, when he is ready, to be to reproduce but also when he's big enough and strong enough to compete with other males he fights another stallion and if he wins then that stallion will either provide him with one of his daughters or if he doesn't have any daughters with his least favorite female and she will be his first edition and she will be the highest ranking female as he continues to collect mares to add to his group so the, the female zebra actually do have a hierarchy. The female that's been with the stallion for longest, his favorite, will be the one that walks in front. And the rest of them will fall behind her in a very, very strict order that is maintained without mercy. So if a female accidentally gets in front of a zebra that she doesn't belong in front of, there'll be some really serious kicks and nips before she is sent to the back of her queue. And in fact, when a zebra stallion establishes his harem, when he has a big group of females and he collects a new one, ooh, there's a little 
lots of niggling going on here. When he collects a new female, that poor female actually has a really rough time of things because the stallion herds her towards his herd, and keeps her with the group, but the other females don't accept her straight away and they will very often essentially bully her, push her to the outskirts, bite her, kick her whenever the opportunity presents. And it takes, it takes several weeks before she becomes an accepted part of the group. The stallion will walk behind in a line like this when they walk through thick vegetation so that he can protect them from the rear whilst the most experienced mare who work, walks in front she'll check ahead for any kind of danger and then you've got the bachelor herds that form their own hierarchy just in terms of practicing their fighting skills on each other before they are ready to go and compete for their own access to females now our stripy horses are moving off into some dense vegetation while we wait for the huge herd of buffalo to make their way towards the water let's go back to some spotted cats well we still can't find some delay but Mbula is still in the tree feeding and the go away birds I think have spotted him because I just had oh. now and if we have a look over there that go away bird is looking straight into the into the into the river system, but Mvula so he keeps checking the opposite bank. So I'm not hundred percent sure where the other leopard is. But I'm gonna try and see if we can move again. He's just moved the carcass into a slightly more difficult spot as we went live of course. I'm just going to go a little bit forward. How's that? I think that's as good as we're going to get. Yeah, you can see he's using the premolars, and they're basically like a really powerful pair of side cutters to cut through the skin of that impala. Now, the legs look like they might fall. Now, I wonder if they do fall, will Sindila take the scavenging option and rush in and grab that meat? And will Mvula chase him? So many questions. And we're just going to have to sit tight to find out. Now, James Richard says, you've got to love the reaction speeds of the big cats. Stiff and sore one second, then up the tree and teaching the little Cindy some manners the next second later. It is incredible. Oh, look at that. He's just moving the carcass a bit to get into a better feeding point. And of course, there's a dead branch in our way. <laughs> and I don't think with all the maneuvering in the world, we're going to get past that one. Might move it again now. I wish I knew where Sindile was. Jason is just referring back to that fight we saw, and he says, That was amazing. How they're able to do that in a tree without falling to the ground is incredible and Jason I agree with you wholeheartedly and I have seen leopards fall out of trees while fighting before and even then quite often when they do fall they still land on their feet it's very unusual that they don't but they are incredibly agile animals oh look at that Oh, 
I took my eyes off Sandile for a second. And he disappeared. I'm still just trying to figure out. I think he might have gone back into the into the river system. There's always a possibility he has moved off after that beating, deciding that what's left there is not worth fighting for. And maybe it's going to be easier to go catch his own kill. I'm just Sorry, I should be on the game drive radio for a second. Take some Vullers up in the Shasha now. All that back quarter of the Impala is hanging quite precariously. It's just held on by a little bit of skin at the moment. A reasonably thick piece of skin, I think. You can hear the go away bird just above him. <laughs> Such a strange noise. Off goes the go away bird. Oh, where is young Sindile? Oh, will that piece of skin be the one that sends the back legs plummeting? I'm really fascinated. If Sindile is close by, if a big piece of meat like that falls, is he going to run away with it? using those powerful pre-molars and side cutters again. So if anyone's wondering what that click clickety click is, it is just me taking a few pictures. We can't really pass up on an opportunity like this. Now, Anna-Marie says they almost sound like scissors cutting into the impala. And that's exactly what they are, a very big and strong pair of scissors. And so I say akin to side cutters, for those of you who know your tools rather than scissors. I wish I could see just a little bit further into the ditch there. Now as I was saying, it was very, pre very precocious of Sindile to think that he could outmuscle muscle Mvula. Mvula has fought many a territorial battle in his life. So, a little bit more experience, but even in that beating, Sindile is going to gain experience, and which could become very useful for him for him in later life. Well, there goes a leg. Now, no movement from beneath. Has Sindile decided to abandon what's left of this carcass after that beating? And you can just see the rib cage there. Most of the meat off the rib cage is gone. There's a little bit on the one hind leg and then of course the neck. But still Oh here he comes, here he comes. He's coming in. He's sneaking in. Yeah, just he's going so slowly I barely saw him. He's gonna see if he can steal that. He's literally in the middle of this thicket here. I'm just gonna move slightly so we can see him. I thought he might be waiting to play the hyena at the base of the tree. You got him? Now, the only problem is playing the hyena. That leg is directly below Mvula's gaze. Now, 
I think he should wait for the more profitable hindquarters. Oh, he's coming in. Hasn't Vula seen him yet? <laughs> Sneaky little devil. Hiding just where we couldn't see him. And I, I, I did expect he might be playing that hyena roll at the base. Lucky for him there's no hyenas because they would have been in there much faster. Here he goes, he's sneaking up to the leg that dropped. Vula hasn't spotted him yet. Now he spotted him. He's deciding that legs doesn't have enough meat on it, but let's see what he does. He's going in for the meat now, for the leg at the base. Right in the thicket here. There's not much meat on it, but some meat's better than none. <laughs> I think we can add a new nickname to young Sindile's many nicknames. The Wanderer, the Survivor, the Hyena. Now, of course, male leopards are not adverse to scavenging at all. Let's just see if we can get a view of both of them from here. Yeah, I just don't want to go too far into the river. You got a view through there? So there he is. Unfortunately, that's the best we can do. I can't really go. Can I go? I can go maybe half a, half a meter a bit further. Is that a bit better? Ah, there we go. Handbrake on. We don't want to plummet nose first into the ditch. Oh, Vul is looking at him out. But he's going to keep feeding rather than run down to fight over a scrap. And it is truly just a little scrap. And Wooler has the majority of that carcass still in the tree. But as you can see, the hind legs are quite precarious at the moment. And there would be a lot more meat on that little section there if that were to fall. Little Cinderella trying to get as much meat off that very skinny leg bone of an impala as possible. looking up forlornly at the rest of the impala he killed. And while status quo has been achieved for the next little while, uh, Jamie's got one of the more impressive sights you see in the Sabi Sands during the winter months. M mountains of dust piling up, so let's go have a look what she's got. Mm. Not so much mountains of dust as sort of rolling hills, since this is a relatively small herd of buffalo but it is absolutely wonderful to have the position that we're in at the moment to watch them push forward and get to the water's edge. The ones in the front that first arrived have been pushed right belly deep into three in a row pan so that the others scrumming at the back can actually get access to the water. 
And watching them approach, the reason that I love these open areas is you can sit back and watch these things happen from a distance. And watching them approach, you can really get an idea of who is leading the group. It's almost invariably the females. And you can just watch a little bit. You can see the concern in their eyes as they all bunch together before they get to the water's edge. A press of bodies to slack their thirst on this winter's morning. Old buffalo cow. See her balding around the base of her horns and around her face. And the air is filled with dust and the smell of... It smells like a dairy farm to continue our scratch and sniff theme. And as always, accompanied by their cohort of ox pickers. Oh, shame, this poor female on the edge here. She can't quite get in. With the steep walls on the other side of the... This is basically the only place that... Where the buffalo have entered is the only spot where they can get in towards the water. Otherwise, they run the risk of falling into it. And injuring themselves. Definitely one of the more impressive sights of winter. Although in this case I think this herd probably only numbers about 50 buffalo. Oh, ox pick irritating him. Buffalo, of course, one of the most water-dependent animals of this area. They need to drink, and they will drink at least once a day, if not more frequently. It's all part of their, the way that their digestive system is structured and the amount of water that it utilizes. The bulls, a lot of the bulls have pushed forward to the front. And some of the youngsters have managed to squeeze their way in, as well as the cows. The ox pickers continuing their daily job. And it's nice for the ox pickers as well because with the amount of ticks and blood that they eat, they also are incredibly water dependent and they regularly fly between the animals that they're feeding off and the water holes in order to quench the thirst that they have acquired. Some of the buffalo move off to make space for others. We've got a perfect, exa perfect example in this. Ah, oh, it's one of the speckled ones. I love the speckled buffalo. They are so cool. You don't often get to see them. That's not actually the official name, by the way. It's just the name that I call them. I feel like they look a little bit like Easter eggs. Or like they've been flicked with white paint. And it's caused by skin conditions, but it ends up looking like they're covered in white dots. I always find them the most fascinating individuals to look at. See how her, different her fur looks to the rest of the herd. And Shamsan has said that the buffalo almost look as though they are wearing war paint and that if we spent enough time with them we would learn to recognize individuals. And yes, absolutely. I mean, that, that buffalo cow we definitely would recognize. There's a few of them around, but if you combine the shape of the balding patches of the different buffalo along with the nicks and tears in their ear as well as the shape and the size of their horns then you can absolutely identify individuals and funnily enough in my old job we used to have to look at the buffalo herd and sort of identify each and every individual female buffalo that was there it's, abs it's entirely possible now I never thought before I started working at Wild Earth and looking through the eyes of the camera that I would become as well acquainted with the buffalo bulls that we see as I have become. And we have started, I mean, we have regularly now turn around whenever we see a buffalo bull and say, oh, we know him, because we see them around the pans and the water holes. There's the one, the most recognizable one for me is the one that looks, Brian says, looks like Taylor Lautner, with his very straight boss across the base of his, or close to the, the top of his eyes. The boss, by the way, is that solid base at 
the bottom of the horns. That is pure bone, or solid bone, along with a keratin sheath and is several inches thick. Essentially the buffalo's main weaponry and exceptionally powerful. If you imagine a, an animal that is close to a ton, a bit less than, so it's not quite so much, but coming up to about 1,600 pounds, moving at a speed of 15 meters per second, 45 feet per second, and colliding with each other, and you get an idea of just how fierce a buffalo fight could be. Shame, these poor cows on the edge have still not managed to get in to have a drink. The wall is so steep there, girl, you need to pick a different spot. You're going to fall down. Go around, go back around. <laughs> Hello, boy. Oh, girl, sorry. Go around. I really like buffalo. I enjoy seeing them, but I wouldn't describe them as the problem solvers of the bush. Let's put it that way. And at the moment, those females need to work out that they need to go back around to go and have a drink. Now she just looks a bit sorry for herself. <laughs> Staring off at the water. Go on, girl. Go back. Here we go. I'm getting there slowly but surely. Let's go back to Brent. Cinderella's on the move. Well, he was on the move. He came to just below the tree. I thought he might try climb again, but he decided better of it. And he's gone back down in front, so we're going to sneak forward again. Ah, there he is. What have you got there? He's licking little bits of blood, shame. And he's eating a bit of stomach lining. He's finished what was left of that little leg and he's basically still just he's, he's actually licking the sand that's got blood on it there looks to be a bit of skin down there as well so maybe there's some congealed blood from where the carcass was He's really, he's lost his big meal and would have kept him going for a few days. Oh, he's looking a little stiff after that altercation. Oh, he's going to lie down and look <laughs> and hope for that bat's back section of the carcass to fall. Still here, Mr. Mvula crunching away above us. So, out of this carcass, Mvula's definitely done well if we look at their bellies. Mvula's definitely the more full of the two. But he's watching. Uh, there's two possible things that might fall. The back legs might be held by the skin, but the way he's eating at the moment, there's always a possibility the rib cage might collapse down. Not much meat on it, but still more than the little pieces of discarded food that Cindela is eating in the drainage system. Now, with all the noise they're making, I'm surprised that we haven't got any spotted hyenas here yet. And that's good for young Sindile. Uh, he can scavenge underneath, get as much protein from this kill as possible. Now, 
Hi, Marianne. Marianne's in Arkansas, and she's wondering how old Mvula is. Um, let me just remember quickly. He's probably about 13 now. Um, and male leopards don't... Or maybe 12 and a half, 13. Uh, male leopards don't normally live beyond 14 years. And occasionally... Uh, there are records broken. There was a male leopard in the Sabi Sands who set the record for the oldest male leopard ever. Um, his name was Camp Pan, and he made it to, I think, 15 and a half, somewhere around there. But he was an incredibly big male leopard, uh, much bigger than Mr. Mvula. Amazing, look at that, how agile leopards are. Crunch, crunch, crunch. Now, <laughs> Anthony Law is wondering, has a, car a leopard carcass ever fallen onto someone under a tree? Well, Anthony, we take great pains not to park under the carcass, because if the carcass falls, quite often the leopard will be coming down after it to protect it. So we always make sure we never park directly underneath the carcass. We always park away to the side. And to park under a carcass would be asking for trouble. I wonder which piece is going to fall next, and I wonder. If Sandile is going to actually scurry off with it. Alsip in Illinois is wondering whether these two leopards would even team up, even though she knows uh, that they are solitary animals. Uh, no, they wouldn't. I mean, Bob, this is about the closest they'd get to teaming up, and you can see there's very much a, a, a dominant from the bigger male in this situation. Well, there seems to be just enough skin hanging on to the back legs to keep it there. And he's feeding out of the throat. Now, there's quite a bit of meat on the... the well, not a lot, but enough to keep a leopard interested in the bottom of the throat and around the cheekbones of the impala. Now, where is Mr. Cindy Lay? He's just moved off. Can you see him? No, it's Okay, well, let's move back. Let's see what he's up to. Now, there's always a possibility, being the precocious youngster that he is, that he might... No, he's having a snooze. 
Let's show you where he is quickly, and then we'll move back from Vula. You got him? There we go. He's just having a snooze, waiting for the next morsel to drop. Now, morsel is probably a strong word. The next scrap to drop from the tree. All right, we're just going to try reposition to get the best view of Mvula. While we do that, Jamie's got an interesting cat trap to show you. So, I don't want to take you away from our leopards for too long. I just want to give you a nice demonstration of a track that we don't often see. Somewhat devastatingly, the track of an animal that we already know is outside of our traverse area. And this is a cheetah track inside of an elephant track. And I'm going to show you exactly what it is because this is the, the really defining thing about a cheetah track. Is these back lobes... The three back lobes, we always talk about the big cats having three back lobes at the back of their foot, are sharp, almost triangular in the way that they are shaped. Other than that, this looks like it could be a hyena track. Apart from its slight turnout that a hyena has, cheetah walks straight. That is the back of the cheetah's foot. Its toes are here. Oh, it's quite tricky sand to draw in. I think I've just made this very indistinct. There's its toes and its claws sticking out because of course the cheetah has non-retractable claws so you'll see the claw in the track whenever you encounter it. The other interesting thing and I'm trying to find a good example but unfortunately the buffalo have come tromping through here and obscured them. The other interesting thing is apart from most of our animals the front foot is bigger than the back foot that's how it works they carry most of the weight on the front of their body which is why the, the back track is much more sort of elongated, a lot thinner. In cheetah, that's the opposite. The back track is actually bigger in order to provide traction for them to run. But I can't really find a nice, clear example. This is, this is sort of the example. This is its front track here. There we go, I've drawn a circle around it. The back track, much more elongated and much larger in size. Oh, I don't want to put my shadow in that. So there you go, just an interesting size comparison. I'm going to go keep my hopes up and go and see if we can't see them from the boundary. But I don't want to take you away from the leopards for too long, so let's send you back there. Well, we're still sitting here. Young Sindile is still sleeping in the river system, and Mvula is making short work of what's left of this impala. Probably one of the best meals he's had in quite some time. Well, still quite a thick piece of skin. That's preventing the hindquarters from falling. But you never know, Mvula might accidentally start snipping the wrong bit. Or before that happens, he might actually reposition the carcass so it's not going to fall. And you can see he's balanced quite precarious there. It's incredible how these animals are able to stand on and move around on those branches like they are. Oh, from a feline predator to a canine predator with Jamie. A highly mobile canine predator, and one we don't see all that often, a black-backed jackal. For all of our viewers that have become, oh, a male black-backed jackal, by the looks of things. 
often very difficult to tell, but he gave us a perfect and very clear demonstration that it is in fact a boy. So, a mammal that we don't often get to see, so an absolute pleasure to see here. He's looking at us intently and suggests to me that he's not terribly relaxed around vehicles. So we'll settle for our position for now. Let's just see where he's planning on going. And then we'll try and loop around him and get you a slightly better view. We see the side-striped jackal pair that has moved into Sandy Patch and Parlor Plains area relatively regularly. But our black-backed jackal tend to be the species that we see the least of. Should we try? Let's try to get to the other side of him. I'm going to try and monitor exactly where he's going from a distance. Let us catch up. Oh, he's moving quickly. So our little jackal species, oh, he's now, he's now galloping across the plains. I don't think that's because of us. I wonder what's got him, and he might actually have picked up on the smell of the cheetah that walked along here. Hello, little yuckle. He's stopped for now in the shade. So our little jackal pairs have their territories that they maintain. They're also entirely monogamous. They mate for life and unless one of them dies in some way they will stay together the entire time forming little families that they keep together with the the pups helping to rear the next litter as they grow older. I think he's gonna stay. I think we can do this. I think he's gonna stay so we can get some nice light on him. Just watching him carefully. <laughs> I'm to have my head on a swivel here to keep an eye on what he's up to. Might have been running back to his partner. There seems to be something there. No, it's just a pile of dung. No little boy. I love Jackal and I always wish that we could hear them. Okay, now he's going to move if I go any closer. I always wish that we heard them more often. There seems to be a very small population. Oh, there he goes again. A very small population of jackal in the Sabi sand. And we don't hear them vocalize all that frequently, but they've got the most beautiful haunting cry. Oh, another one. Marking his territory. I wonder where his lady friend is. And as you can see, just by the shape of him, oh, there, there it is. Where did you come from? Here's his girlfriend, or his wife, I suppose. Slightly more slender, not quite as stocky and muscular as the male. Watching her mate vanish off before trotting after him. Oh, wonderful. Two black jackal. Basically filling the same ecological niche as foxes do in parts of Europe and America, and also coyotes. For those of you who are watching in America or the North Americas. He's going, he's going, catch up with him. So this is our, oh, where'd she go? Oh, there she comes. This is our black-backed jackal pair. They don't really have a time of day that they're more active. In theory, they're nocturnal, but we see them pretty much any time of day. She's following behind her mate. Let's try and keep up with them. They're going to cross, mar cross into Mala Mala. They're going to just go behind some trees, so I'm going to try and reposition us. Whee! Some delicate reversing. There we go, they're already crossed. You're just saying it is so uncane a day to be monogamous. Mm. There's one there, Jandre, just crossed the boundary. She's running. Yeah, I can't see the trees. And, uh, that. There with that one. Yeah, that other one. Um, so, kind of, in that certainly with breeds of dogs, they are very much essentially they will mate with any potential suitor that they can find but if you think about it wolves are monogamous the alpha pair of the pack breeds there goes the second one over there genre he's gonna go behind the trees there 
I'll try reposition. Oh, you got that one. Cool. I'll stop here. Uh, wolves are monogamous. Wild dogs are essentially monogamous, although I'd, I wouldn't describe them that way. But certainly for our little jackal species, they are very special, just in terms of the fact that they form these very, very tight pair bonds. I, I do see what you're saying, though, because even with wolves, you get that possibility of a, a beta wolf mating and reproducing. So it's not pure monogamy in the same way that it is with jackal. I find it interesting that our smallest canids, or some of our smallest canids, as well as our smallest antelope, both adopt a similar approach. So the steenbok that we saw earlier, also monogamous, also with their own fiercely defended little territories. It would be interesting to know what correlation there is between the size of an animal and the way in which they are their social structure, essentially, the way in which they are adapted to function. Right, since our jackal pair are playing relatively hard to get, I'm going to send you back across to Brent and Mvula, who is enjoying some breakfast. Unlike so he's repositioned himself in quite an awkward spot for us to get a, a visual of but he's still there Sindila is still down in the drainage line and unfortunately not the best view at the moment but as we've seen things can change now from this angle I can see there's still quite a thick piece of skin that's actually holding those that rump and hind quarters but the one thing we can see, which we couldn't see earlier, is if we come down onto the hind quarters, we can see there all the patches of fur that the leopards have plucked in their feeding process. He has basically, since the fight, not stopped feeding. He's trying to get as much of that protein as possible. And of course, young Cinderella is severely hoping that he drops some more meat for him but at the moment I don't think it's likely with the thickness of the carcass that's remaining He's just growled. I can't see if Cindile has moved. I think he just growled for the sake of growling. <laughs> oh, there we go. He doesn't want to drop that rump. He's pulling it back up. Unlucky young Cindile. Ah, it's now in a far better position. Not for us to see, but for Mvula to make sure <laughs> it doesn't fall. Uh, hi, uh, Gilly, who's in Wisconsin. Uh, Gilly's asking, is there a smell when you're this close to leopards? Um, or does the cleanup they manage to do with their tongue suffice? Now, at this distance, there's no real smell. I can smell the meat. Um, but I can't smell the leopards. But when you are very close to leopards, they do have the aroma of decay. Now, they do eat very rotten meat from time to time. 
and they're not the most cleanly animals, although they look very cleanly. They are quite smelly. But from this distance, no smell at all. Oh, he's coming down. Um, Sindile, I'm just going to move forward slightly. Uh, Sindile is growling back at him. We're just going to get ourselves possibly in a good position here. So Sindile is just off frame down there, but we're going to stick on him, Wula. The growling started again. Is he going to chase that young male off? He's eaten as much as he can. And at the moment, he can't really eat any more. That's why he stopped feeding. Oh, he just seems to be having a rest mid tree at the moment. But it's not a very comfortable tree to sleep in. So... There's a strong likelihood he is going to come down the tree. He's doing a bit of cleaning while he's there. And Sindile is just watching very carefully now if he comes down will Sindile try go up and will there be another fight Watching carefully to see what happens. Okay, before he comes down, I thought he might come straight down. I'm going to try to get us into a better position to see his descent. driving there. There we go. Oh, there we go. Perfect timing to get you in the spot. Oh, growling, growling, growling. Oh. <laughs> that is definitely one of the least graceful descends I've seen a male leopard do. And as he was coming down, I did notice a big puncture mark in his sh shoulder look at that you can see there where the dirt was earlier on his neck there there's some wounds from fighting now they could have been opened up in that little spat he had with Sindile okay quickly onto the tree onto the tree Sindile looks like he's going to take this opportunity to go try feed here he comes here he comes going to be precocious enough to take that chance. Mvula is just four feet to my right. He's not really looking at the moment at Sindile. He's growling, but he's lying down. Oh, look at the snarling. I, I think he's going to
going to take the chance. Oopsie, there goes my radio. He's going to take the chance. He's going to go up the tree. One, he's preparing. He's still watching Vula. He doesn't want to get caught up in the tree again. Now, oh no, he's decided. <laughs> Discretion is the better part of valor. For now, I think the, the, the kill there is going to be too much for him to resist. He's going he's gonna to climb the tree. And Vula is just off over here on the other side of this quarry bush. Sleeping or resting a very full belly and let's just see what happens now that one low ground I really think the re main reason he doesn't want to climb the trees he doesn't want to be caught on those branches with a big male leopard coming at him okay he's coming back he's looking up at the carcass he's going to do it you are such a precocious little one Beautiful light on him. Here we go. Little snarl. As he turns his back, oh, he quickly turns around again. Doesn't want to take his eyes off from Vula for too long. Here he goes. Now, Vula has eaten most of the carcass. He's probably wondering, it's probably not worth the risk. Now, last time, the only time Mvula attacked is once he started feeding. Now, I'm watching Mvula carefully. I, from his body language, I don't think he's going to... going to move at the moment. Sandile is not feeding yet. He's keeping a very close eye on Mvula. He's not really... Growling, he's just snarling, he's not giving this, emitting the same deep growls. Okay, he's starting to feed. Now, let's try it reposition and let's give you a quick look at him, Vula. It doesn't look like he's going to charge up there right away. And he's just... I mean, he's still growling. And Sandile is, is feeding. Okay, let's just try to get a better position. He's also... Not in the best spot for us to see nicely. I think from a bit further back is going to be the best. How's that? He's got his back to us, and there's no way for us to get down uh, without being in a precarious position. Very interesting to see what Mvula does. I think he's he's eaten enough, he's just going to lie there. And I think young Sandile is going to try to eat as much as possible in as short a time as possible. There's very little left on this carcass. But I'll keep an eye on both leopards. Gabby. Uh, Gabby is in a, play, a very beautiful part of the United States, Colorado. Great fishing there. Great skiing as well. Uh, Gabby is wondering what happens uh, when a solo predator, like a leopard, kills an animal that's too big for it to eat in one sitting. What do they do? Well, Gabby, unless it is stolen by another larger predator, 
they will feed on it for as long as possible. And none of the predators here mind feeding off completely rotting meat full of maggots. In a leopard's case, they stash it in a tree, eat as much as they can, then go sleep. Once they've digested it, go eat some more. And now Mvula is so full, he can't eat anymore. That's why he's left that carcass. And there's very little meat left, and that's probably why the young male, Sindila, has had a chance to get up there and feed. And it's so fascinating having two male leopards at very different points in their lives. Sindila still too young to challenge for territory, and uh, he's he's probably got two or three, maybe even four years before he's big enough to really challenge for his own territory. And then you've got Mvula, who's lost his territory and is moving towards the end of his life. So absolutely fascinating behavior we're witnessing here. So just behind in this thicket there is Mvula. And, uh, whoopsie, oh shit, hold on. Oh, sorry about that. My clutch has disappeared. <laughs> My clutch disappeared. I'm, I'm going to have to try and do something. Sorry about my <laughs> bad language there, but we literally nearly disappeared into a very big hole. The leopards took no notice of us. <laughs> okay, um, I think I've got it under control now. Wow. I don't know. Okay, I'm going to have to do um, something that's a bit, a bit tricky, but we should be able to do it. So I'm only going to... So basically in low range you can get away with a bit of stuff, there we go, um, without using the clutch. It's not ideal, but we can do it. There's just a little bit of a slip there. Okay, oh, all, all's well. <laughs> There's a bit of excitement, we've had leopard excitement, we've had car excitement. Uh, yes, I, I'm okay. I'm just trying to get us a better view. Um, I don't think we're going to get a better view of young Sindila. He's showing us the back end. There we go. You can see it there. But Mvula is up on the termite mound looking quite pretty. So I'm just trying to reposition. There we go. How's that? Handbrake up. <laughs> Here we are. All's well that ends well. <laughs> so here you can see how big his belly is. He's resting on the termite mile now. He still keeps watching the young male feed, but it's probably not the, worth the risk of injury for the amount of meat that's left. And that's why he's heading that male feed. I think by the end, <clears throat> or actually by sunset safari this evening, I think there's going to be very, very little left in this carcass if anything at all. There we go, there's the young male. Showing us a very pretty tail, flicking around as he's feeding. Okay, heart rate's down a little bit, so. <laughs> now, this young leopard 
um, who's had that very interesting life of catching rabid dogs, going to live in quarantine and being re-released, has got that very noticeable tracking collar around his neck. And Michael, who's 18 years old, um, is wondering, oh, he says he thought Cindile's collar was supposed to drop off. And how is that going to happen? And how are the scientists going to find it? So it is still pinging occasionally, which means the battery life is dying. Um, when I say pinging, it means it pings a satellite to send a location. And uh, what happens is when it gets to a certain size, there's a sensor that's operated off a slightly different battery system that will immediately feel that it's getting too tight or sense it's getting too tight and it'll, it'll pop off. And then there's a little transponder that's also on a, a different battery. Or all the, oh no, sorry. The main battery makes sure that there's enough battery um, that as soon as it drops off, it pings um, its last location. And, and then it'll say it dropped off, ping, at this point. And then the scientists can go back with the GPS to those exact coordinates and pick up the collar. And to put, those collars are actually completely sealed. Um, to put a new battery in, you actually have to almost break them apart and remake them. Now, they have to be completely sealed because, of course, you, see, you saw what happened here. Yeah? And obviously rain and water and things like that. And uh, they can take quite a beating as this collar. And in this circumstance, you probably find that collar protected them a little bit around the neck from all those blows from Mvula. Now, Mvula is now fast asleep. And Sindile is still feeding. Oh, you're going to drop a leg now, mister. Mvula's pretty much eaten all the meat around the neck. There's a bit on the rump. And that's what he's feeding off at the moment. Um, let's see, I think we might be able to get a bit of view of him feeding. Okay, the car is playing along at the moment. Here we go. Not ideal. Uh, I'm going to try find a spot to uh, get you a view of what's going on up in the tree. While I do that, uh, let's go see how Jamie's going. Uh, Jamie is on her way back towards Juma to find out what's been happening while I've been gone since our cheetah managed to escape us this morning. I have to tell you that my first response when I heard of Brent's misfortunes was to have a good chuckle. But thinking about it now, there were several times yesterday where I was genuinely a bit nervous that Dave and myself were about to go careering into the drainage line itself. It's a very, very tricky spot, so I actually can only imagine how nerve-wracking that must have been. And whilst the chances of having an accident out here are very slim, things can go wrong, and they do occasionally, very seldom. But there are some horror stories about vehicles rolling. It's definitely something that I'm sure Brent is very keen to avoid. Alright, well we are on our way along the southern boundary. Tingana crossed just behind me into the property called Torchwood. Oh, goodness. Corrugations. The one thing about this particular road is because it's a main road, there's lots and lots of vehicle traffic and usually vehicle traffic traveling at a relatively high speed just to get from one lodge to another or from the gate to a lodge and so on then you've got to pick your spot very wisely as you drive along here but what an absolutely extraordinary morning that you have enjoyed with Brent really truly fascinating situation that's been playing out there Anything here? No. Seems as though all of the animals in this particular part, in the eastern part of the Sabi Sands, have decided that they actually would much rather stay in bed or find a patch of sun where they can warm themselves up. 
because it's been incredibly quiet this side apart from our herd of buffalo zebra and one wildebeest and the steambok it has been unbelievably quiet here Sorry, I'm still having a good chuckle. <laughs> now that I know that all is fine, John, you should have heard Jandre. Jandre and myself. I was crying at one point. I was laughing so hard. <laughs> and I haven't even got to watch it yet, which I can guarantee I'm going to do as soon as we get home. In fact, we might not even go back to camp first. We might do a quick stop off at Final Control and um, watch the replay just to keep ourselves thoroughly entertained. Since Genre and myself have had somewhat of a quiet morning, haven't we? It's been a bit quiet here. We've both sort of been attempting to control our jealousy at the sighting that's been playing out with Brent and Gert. Love to be there for those moments. Here comes the Mulwanini. Hopefully there's something hanging around before we get there. Come on, Batalia. Look at something is making a terrible racket. Oh, awesome. Well done, Jandre. A male Batalia, you can see the small tail. Very, very short tail. Used to be known as a short tailed eagle. He's giving us a beautiful demonstration of his colours. A male, due to the half black and half white underneath his wings, one of the few birds of prey where you can tell the difference between males and females. And a bird thought to be the very first, in local beliefs, the very first creature to watch the very first sunrise when the world was created. And we will be there to watch the sun set. I'm sorry, I'm distracted from the battalier. As magnificent as it is, well done to Jandre for his fantastic camera work. I can't work it out where it is. It's just a really noisy bird. And I can't work out what it is either. I think it's a drongo. But it's screech screeching. Where are you? What are you so upset about? Let's go forward a little bit. I want to see what it is. I can hear a roller. Oh, is that it up there? Is that... Uh, the forktail drongo there? I think, yeah, we can, of course. We can't roll, unfortunately. We're stuck just in the wrong spot. Here we go. It is that drongo. Making such a racket. I wonder what it's imitating. Or attempting to imitate. They are the world's, the bird, mimics of the bird world out here. Along with the scrub, oh goodness, scrub robins. I mean, that's his normal call. That harsh sound is his normal call. But that chirrup, chirrup, chirrup. Maybe imitating a scrub robin. The tricksters of the bird world. Even going so far as to catch out the most experienced bird watchers in their imitation. They imitate scops owls. Chagras, anything with a really lyrical vocal sound, they will imitate. And they will imitate mammal calls as well, is the famous example of the drongo that imitates meerkat alarm calls. Right, while we travel through the Mulwanini and out of signal range, accompanied to the soundtrack of our mimicking drongo, let's go back to Brent and his leopards.
Oh, we're still sitting here. It seems like there's a vehicle coming in. I'm not sure who it is. And Mbule is still sleeping to the right of us. Young Sindile is still on the tree. Station approaching the Ingwe. Come in. Now, if um, the young one is in the in the Shasha and the old one is lying on the Shadulu next to me, best view is from my side. I can make space for you if you want. Okay, so sorry about that. Ephraim's just coming to have a look at the leopards. And now Mr. Mvula is still lying. He's opened his eyes. He's keeping a casual eye on young Sindile. There he is. Oh, sorry. I just got to talk to Jamie quickly. Everyone else. Oh, no. Someone else is doing it for me. There we go. So you can see the eye open. Casual eye on so I'm just going to try move forward a tiny bit to have a look at his eyes. How's that? There we go. You can have a look at those beautiful eyes. He does have very striking eyes, Mr. Mvula. Still keeping an eye out on the youngster in the tree. But with that full belly, probably not worth his while going to have a fight with him again. fighting to keep his eyes open. I mean, they just, the lids seem to be getting heavier and heavier. Hi, Lois in Buffalo. Lois is wondering about Mvula's right eye. Um, she said, wasn't it badly injured about a year ago? A lot of people thought it was. Um, as I said at the time, I think he, he just basically he had a burst blood vessel in his eye. Um, it wasn't nearly as serious as it looked. Um, and those type of injuries are common uh, in leopards and lions. And they do have the amazing, amazing abilities to recuperate quickly. Tired kitty. And he just keeps opening his eyes to keep an eye on Sindile and the tree. We don't have a good visual of it at the moment. There's young Sindile. So, Siberia is wondering, what happens to these animals when they die? Um, are they given to science? Are they buried? Are they just left for scavengers? Uh, most of the time, we never actually see them die or find them dead. The scavengers destroy what's left of that carcass very quickly. If we do find a carcass, um, because of a lot of the, the research into feline and bovine tuberculosis in this area, um, the carcass will be handed over to the state vet. That happens very, very seldom though, um, because the scavengers generally get there far before anybody else.
Okay, so I don't think too much more is going to happen here. So I'm going to make space for another vehicle to come in. And uh, it has been the most enthralling encounter. And remember, patience pays off. We sat with sleeping cats for an hour and 10 or 15 minutes before the pandemonium that ensued. And we got incredible views of Mvula feeding uh, Sindile playing the hyena at the base of the tree. So it has been an incredible morning. A little bit of excitement as we nearly disappeared into the river system. Fortunately, it seems like that's not going to happen again. And uh, well, if it does, hopefully you can't watch me and my face goes pale and I have a stricken panic look on my face and use bad words. So I do apologize again for that. I did get a little fright and I think, uh, uh, did you get a fright? Yeah, no, I don't know where we were going. <laughs> Kurt doesn't know where he's going. What he said when we were off there is he imagined we were going to hit that Timberti tree and Sindile was going to fall on top of him. Fortunately, that didn't happen. So <laughs> we're going to move out. While we move out, let's go see how Jamie's doing. Well, Brent attempts to wrestle his vehicle back under his control. I thought we'd do for the last few moments just a quick check. Karula must by now have finished her daker kill. Karula, of course, being the female leopard in whose territory we currently find ourselves. Uh, she is busy eating a daker south of our traverse area. I think that she will have finished. In fact, I know she will have finished that by now. That was three days ago. I just want to go and check her popular spots to see whether or not she has decided to return to our area. Oh, Christy is also playing games with me this morning. Definitely feeling less comfortable than it normally does. She normally does. Oh, hello! Go and say hello to what looks like Taxon quickly. Morning. How are, How are you? Good. How are you? Good. Thanks. Hi, guys. Hi. Hi. Yeah. Yeah. No updates from no CP. No. No. Can't. Can't go south. No impala. Nothing. No, actually. Some <laughs> couple of zebra, <laughs> one wildebeest, and a steenbok or two. Okay. Otherwise, it's perfect morning. Uh, right. Okay. Nice. Cheers, Cheers, guys. Cheers. 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 <laughs> Standing by. Copy, thanks, I'm a bit far. So Brent's just giving me an update on what's happening while I've been on cheetah planes. It seems as though we have a very good prospect for that mating lion pair for the sunset safari this afternoon. And then, of course, we'll also be most definitely returning back to Sindile and Mbula to find out what's been happening while we've been away. Exciting, exciting times for all of us in terms of the, we really, I mean, we've just had the most incredible sightings recently. Let's just do a quick check of a treehouse dam. Find out what's happening here. And then we will immediately start wending our way back towards final control to watch a video that I'm sure is going to have us chuckling for the rest of the day. For the rest of the week, says Lou. Promises, promises. Oh, I don't see any leopard tracks, but I do think I saw an elephant. But it's very far away. Let's try and get around to it before I even try and point it out to you. Or is it? No, it's zebra. Sorry, it's zebra on a. You see a water dog? Oh, water bug. I definitely see zebra as well. Uh, or, or else I really need my eyes tested. <laughs> Let's go 
around to the other side of Treehouse Dam. Alright, well, there's all kinds of exciting things in the pipeline. And one of them means that Brent is going to have to say farewell to you a little bit earlier. Let's send you across to him so that he can say his goodbyes. So it has been an absolutely fantastic, fantastic sunrise safari. And what incredible interaction between those male leopards. That is definitely not something you get to see every day. And I'm so ecstatic that I got to share it with all of you. And uh, it has been unbelievable. Now, as Jamie said, there's some exciting things in the pipeline. And we're not going to say more than that. So I'm going to head home a little early at uh, this sunrise safari. But never fear, we'll be back for the sunset safari. And uh, hopefully cats will abound. Now, apart from the leopards we spent all drive with, while we were sitting there, we heard those lions roaring. Taxon did find them. So there's a possibility that we can have lion and leopard again on the sunset safari. So very exciting. So from Karat to myself, it's been an absolute pleasure and we will see you soon. That's right. For the last few moments of the sunset safari, you will be with myself and Jandre and we're going to see what other wonders we can find, although I think to top the sighting that you had this morning might be a little bit of a tricky thing to do. But you never know, there's still, un there's still lion cubs somewhere around here that have not yet been located. And because it's a live safari, I'm not going to say you never know what to expect, but you really don't know what to expect. We'll have to try and think up a new tagline. Something similar to what's around, the, you never know what's around the next corner, but different. And reserve that for whenever Hayden comes back to visit us. Hello, zebra. You're not a lip. You're not an elephant at all, are you? You're a zebra. Fair enough. They were much higher than I realised in terms of height, which explains the confusion. But doesn't defend it. Just explains it. And even now, trying to get them. Oh, I'm snorting. They're definitely playing hard to get. Seems to be, seems to be a zebra-filled morning this morning. Lots of our stripy horses around. I seem to go through phases. It's either water buck or zebra. in Iowa. I was silent there for a minute because I'm trying to think about the answer to your question. In terms of dentition, yes, zebra's dentition is very similar to horses, domestic horses. There probably are one or two differences just because they have evolved, as you suggested, to eat slightly different food. I wouldn't necessarily say that it's harder than your average domestic horse, but then also I'm not as familiar with the diet of a your average domestic horse in in different places around the world. I have absolutely, to be 100% honest with you, I have no idea what floating means or what it means for a domestic horse to get their teeth floated. So I'm afraid I can't actually help you there. Right, I see. Okay, so apparently it is the grinding down, and I did not know this, but it's the grinding down of the sharp points of the horse's teeth so that they don't need, or so that they are not too sharp and they can grind their food. So no, I don't think that a zebra has to do that. They ingest, I guess in a way, maybe that does mean that they ingest far more in the way of a solid food. They eat a lot of harsh grasses. But I think more than that, they actually have to eat a little bit more in order to sustain themselves because their diet out here, unless it is in the middle of summer, 
they have to consume a considerable amount of food in order to meet their nutritional requirements. That's why they're known as bulk grazers. So that constant chewing will probably keep the teeth ground down. I mean, you can go and try and float a, a zebra's teeth if you want. I wouldn't advise it, though. I think they'd probably object in the strongest possible terms. Having been bitten by a zebra once before, I can tell you in no uncertain terms that whilst their molars might be ground down, their incisors certainly aren't, and they hurt. <laughs> they really, really hurt. There's nothing like a zebra clamping down on one shoulder to remind you of just how powerful their jaws are. It is like being bitten by a horse, but worse. Um, so I'm afraid to say I, my dentition knowledge of a zebra is relatively not well known, but it makes sense to me that they have evolved to not need human intervention. Obviously they, they've evolved to not need human intervention. Perhaps there's also a certain amount of dirt that they consume. Oh, the lions came this way. Hold on. No, hold on. Sorry, wait one moment. I say lion. Oh, no, sorry. Tingana came this way. It was got to be Tingana because Mvula is accounted for. The Anderson male wouldn't have come this far. And Tingana is now on Torchwood, so he came, he took his usual favorite spot. His favorite walkway, he loves to walk along this road, this treehouse road. Here his tracks are down there. Very, very clear paw prints. Walking along the sand. And that must have been some time last night. But then he walked, he must have walked really far. We're at Treehouse Dam now and he came north from Cheetah Plains Lodge. Unless there's another mysterious big male in this area. Which is always a possibility. But that's a big male leopard. Very big male leopard. I would suggest that it has to be Tingana. And of course Tingana can cover enormous amounts of distances. <laughs> We've got some more slogan suggestions. Gary said, Safari Live, where every drive is a new adventure. Absolutely 100% true for us as well as for you guys. Each drive is completely unexpected and never ever ever goes entirely according to plan. So yes, a perfect description would be a new adventure. About something like Safari Live, the only thing missing is the smells. I'm still fixed on the scratch and sniff book. Curious one says Keep your eyes in the skies for leaping leopards. You certainly had some leaping leopards this morning on your sunrise safari. It sounds absolutely marvelous. Truly exciting sighting. I have to tell you, just to move on a little bit, we're going to have to keep checking for this for wherever the hyena with the cubs has gone. There are tracks absolutely everywhere on Juma. I didn't have a chance to go and check the Galago shortcut den, but I still have a sneaking suspicion that she's around there. So for the, those of you that are hyena lovers, I haven't given up just yet, so never fear. I am still going to keep trying to find us our hyena den, even if the main part of the clan has moved to the northern part, outside of our traverse area. We will just have to keep on looking. And at this point I can probably dispose of the hot water bottle that's been on it. It's not that cold anymore. Now it's just more for comfort than it is for anything else. I still think my the scratch and sniff book idea has merit. Although Jandre suggested that perhaps the page with lion scat might overpower every other smell. Which is a fair enough point, we'd have to think a way around that. But I'm sure there are some very clever people who could think a way around it. And maybe it'll be a reality in the next hundred or so years, when Safari Live is still going. I can't even begin to imagine what that would be like in a hundred years time. Hmm. 
a hello to Lee in Arkansas and welcome as always to the Sunrise Safari, albeit to the end of our Sunrise Safari. What would my dream safari include was your question. Oh, that's a, this is a really difficult one. I have to be 100% honest with you. I, I probably, not because I don't love it here, I absolutely do love the African bushfalls and the low felt bushfalls, but there are places in Africa that I really, really would love to go and visit, and one of them is Ethiopia. I'm absolutely fascinated by the idea of some of the places there, and I would love, it's the human history and the animal history combined that I find a really attractive prospect. Uh, maybe traveling as much as possible through different places. I mean, now I'm thinking sort of along the lines of a six month safari as opposed to your average two weeks. But I think that if I had to choose, that would be my dream safari experience. But it's a difficult question. There's so, Africa as a continent just has so many incredible things to offer. And I don't know how I would begin to choose if you let me loose with an unlimited budget and an unlimited amount of time. You probably never see me again, um, if I'm completely honest. Oh, we've come to the end of our sunrise safari. You'll have a very special man to look forward to on the sunset safari this afternoon. Mr. Stefan Winterboer will be back in the driver's seat once again. That, of course, depends on how much Wendy's been broken because Steph might be on foot. <laughs> depending upon the damage to the vehicle. But there you've got that to look forward to for your sunset drive and of course we will be returning to the site of those leopards. But for now it is time for us to end off. Big thank you as always to jean -Dre for his company as well as his amazing camera work as always. To Lou and to Rebecca in final control and mostly to all of you watching across the globe. I hope you've had a marvelous sunrise safari and that you are Looking forward to the sunset for in a couple of hours. Bye-bye, everybody.